Sal Berry. Shifty Pivots could be a rap album by Patrick yeah, Kane. And Tim Parrish. Because they're speed merchants. They're selling speed. Speed is bad. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Happy summer. Happy August. You're listening to another edition of the Puck Junk Podcast. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the 2017 National Sports Collectors Convention, which was in the Chicago, well, they say it was in Chicago, it was in the Chicago suburb of Rosemont, but everybody just says Chicago because it's close enough. Uh, anyway, Sal Barry here, along with Tim Parrish, aka the real DFG on Twitter. So, uh, Tim, you've been to a couple nationals now. What was your take on your one day sprint through the show? Uh, that was actually my sixth or seventh. I think it was really? my seventh national. Wow. So you went to ones outside of Chicago? Uh, no, I've only been to ones in Chicago. But my first one in Chicago was in 90, was it 92, 93, something like that? I believe there was, that was one. was my in, first one. I believe there was one in 93, and I was really upset that I didn't go because I found out about it kind of like last minute. And so I remember I didn't go to, I didn't go to the national that year but i went to wizard world chicago back when it was called comic-con chicago now it's called comic-con chicago again but anyway um but i was just like oh yeah. damn i missed the national that sucks and that was in that was the first one i ever went to and it, they held it at the uh the merc um yeah it was at the Mer- mercantile or not mercantile she the whatchamacallit merchandise um, mart mccormick place mccormick place. It was in mccormick place okay so and what was that like? I mean, if you could, if if you could think that far back, what was that particular um, national like? Um. Well, you got to figure. I was. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I was still a kid. Uh, um. So it was, it was very overwhelming for to go in there as a kid and be able to see as as much stuff as you could see. From a collecting standpoint, mm-hmm. I mean, you got to figure that's that was about the heart of the um, overproduction era of cards, and every company imaginable that tried to make cards had, you know, had the, the, there was a glut of stuff in the card market. But I remember back then they didn't really keep autograph guests separate from the general population. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was a designated area where there would be signers signing autographs, and mostly they would be tables set off to the side, and so there, that would be the autograph area. But when they were bringing people from one place to another, they were walking them right through the crowd. So so many different you know sports stars and, and things came through. We almost got run over by Mario Lemieux and his his entourage at one point. They were we were standing at a table kind of in the middle and. There's him surrounded by like six giant dudes. <laughs> they were escorting him to a table to to sign. So it was uh, it was interesting. Hard to believe that they were but, taller um, than uh, Mario Lemieux. No, he stood out in the in the middle, but they kind of surrounded him. Mm-hmm. But um, you know that that was a fun show. They gave out. Um, VIP, well not VIP bags, I guess now they, they would be VIP bags, but they gave out giveaways at the door when you went in, um, all sorts of promo cards and whatnot. You know, now you walk in the door, um, you don't really get handed anything for free unless you have the VIP um, level of, of access. So... Um, you know, it's different, and it changes with times. I mean, the manufacturers are a lot more involved now than I think they were back then. Um, they certainly were represented back then, but it was more dealers than anything else, I think. Okay. And obviously, so, box breaking and stuff like that was not a thing yet. Yeah, it was a, it was group, a much... You know, group breaks and all that. Much simpler time, the, the, the time that we all long for I, in, it, in some ways. And you didn't have you didn't have memorabilia companies there. 
You didn't have auction houses there. Mm -hmm. You didn't have, you know, all of those things that have become commonplace in the market now, you know, grading BGS, you know, uh, PSA, you know, SGA, all of those grading services didn't exist. They weren't there. So, you know, you didn't have all of that active participation with all levels of the hobby like you do now. Right. So, okay. So your first one was back in 93. So, uh, what was your take on the show this year? Maybe not even comparing uh, it to it, but just, I mean, I got a lot to say, but, uh, you know, well, I, I guess I can interject my thoughts now. I went, sure. for, I went for four days. I was burnt out by Saturday. I was just like, I, you know, it's funny when you find, when you, when you have to find reasons to go to a card show, like when in your mind, when you find, you say you have to like talk yourself into it, you really shouldn't go. You know, with, with, that's true of most anything. I mean, you know, there might be some things we don't like going to the doctor, but we got to talk ourselves into it because we know it's for our own good or whatever. But like something that's supposed to be a fun thing. And I did have fun. The la uh, what was it back in uh, 2015? I went four out of five days. So I like went for two days, took a day off because I had something else going on, then went for like another two days. And that like break in the middle was I don't want to say it was kind of nice, but like I was still eager to like go those next two days. And then in like 2013 and 2011, I went for all five days and probably enjoyed every day of it. But this year I was just a little burnt out after the fourth day. And then I was just like, well, if I go on Sunday, I'm going to spend more money. And the only things that I kind of wanted to go back and buy were things that I know I can find elsewhere. They weren't anything that was like super hard to come by or like something that I'd be kicking myself for not buying just stuff that I needed for my collection. But you know, some of it was just like cards that eh, I know I'll get these sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. I mean, that's, that's a, a very, I, I hate to use the word overwhelming again, but it's a very overwhelming or ordeal and task to make your way through something as big as the national in just one day. And that's what I've done like almost every year that I've gone. I think there's only one time I ever went two days. Um, and so, you know, having, having access to all the days there, I could, I could definitely see that, you know, after two or three days being able to, you've already seen everything, you've already done everything and pretty much you're at the point where, the more you walk around, the more money you spend. And if that's not what you're there for, then obviously that's not the thing. I went for one day, took the family, um, you know, my wife and the three kids, and we had a blast. I mean, it was a good time. Everybody had fun. My wife had fun. The kids had a blast. I was amazed at how accommodating dealers were with kids. Because, you, you know, you have these shows and a lot of dealers take take themselves way too seriously, I think, sometimes. So they have all these boxes of cards laying out and they're marked five cents, ten cents, a quarter, whatever. And, you know, little kids step up to the counter and start flipping through the cards and start looking through things. A lot of dealers get apprehensive about that sometimes and, and you know, kind of, where's the parents, you know, put a leash on your kid, that kind of thing, but... I've seen that in the past. I didn't get that this year. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much everywhere we went and tables we were looking at and people we were talking to, I mean, dealers were like, with with my kids, I don't, and I'm not saying they're, you know, anything special, but past to other other children, but you know, they were walking up to tables and looking at stuff, and dealers were coming up to them. Hey guys, you know, what do you collect? And talking to them and engaging with them, and so many tables they come walking up to me, Dad, look what I got. And they'd have a pile of cards in their hands. I'm like, where'd you get those? And they're like, the guy told us we could pick out like five cards out of these boxes that we wanted. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. And so, you know, they came away with a pretty giant stack of cards that cost them nothing um, just because, you know, people were, were nice to the kids. And there, there were so many giveaways, um, manufacturer booths and everything else, giving away promotional items and stuff like that. I'd have to say my my... The most interesting one was um, the kids participated in one of Panini's kids free kids group breaks. Yes, tell tell us about uh, that. It, well, 
they did their one Saturday afternoon. Panini sets up, um, and they do a pretty good job with it. Uh, um, the last national, my kids participated in it, and they had a, they had a blast with it. So we got them in there this year, and basically they set a block of time off and decide that they're going to open up a case of something, whether it's a, some kind of basketball product or football or or whatnot, and they do kind of like a draft lottery, but kids get in line, and you get a random envelope that's mm-hmm. not marked. Inside the envelope is the team that you're you're assigned. Right. Any group break, they sit up there, they bust open packs, and whatever the cards are, the, the team they belong to, if you, you're wearing that team lanyard, you get the cards. So they got into um, black gold football. I think they did a case of black gold football. All right. Um, which, if you look at packs of those, they're, you know, that's like a $200, $300 product or something like that. And so it's a it's a premium premium product. And they, they were pulling kids up out of the crowd, open packs with them and everything else. And my three at least got one card each. Nice. We had the... Uh, we had the Miami Dolphins, the Philadelphia Eagles, and the uh, Seattle Seahawks. Okay. And my old my oldest got two Seahawks cards, and the other two got um, there was a base. I think there was a base Eagles card in one of the packs, and uh, my middle kid he uh, got some kind of four piece patch card of some guy i have no idea who it was had like a piece of football in it and stuff so it was but it was a lot of fun and they you know they do it pretty well but it was the the giveaway that i was talking about they were going through the crowd and handing out little things kids got fidget spinners were all over the place as you can attest to yes like every every place that was giving away free stuff you know i think last year it was stress or the last national in chicago was stress ball Everybody had dress balls. This time, fidget spinners. They were everywhere. I think each of my there's different colors, but they were handing those out. And they had a, a somebody came through the crowd with a box of stuff that was I didn't see what it was, but it had the Panini logo on it. Turns out it was a box cutter. And so they were handing these out to kids, and I stood there thinking, what? <laughs> They're giving box cutters to kids that. Are filled with razor blades. Wow! No, yeah, I yeah. was like, that's. Nuts. I was like, what? You got to. But so of course we get that. And as soon as, as soon as my wife saw what it was, she's like, I'll take that. Yeah. She threw it, she threw it in her bag. I was like, I don't, I don't know if the person handing this stuff out actually looked and saw what they were handing out. I think so, they thought it was a marker or something. Oh yeah, a panini box cutter. So when you do your box breaks, you but can. It, Cut the cut the yeah. paper or the the foil the wrapper off of it. Oh yeah, <laughs> I see that. So yeah, yeah it looks like a, a swing box cutter. Oh my it's god, a nice little blade. Wow. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You gotta wow. love that. It's like just just describing what so, you showed me. So it's but, like a, you know, it's like a, it's like a cheap, not like it's not like the heavy duty box cutter that's metal that like somebody in a warehouse would use, but it's like the plastic one. Uh, and it's got the Panini logo on it, and then you could, it has, like, the blades that, like, you could break off when they get dull. So, wow, that's, that is, yeah. that, that has got to be the weirdest, like, giveaway I've seen. And, you know, giving it yeah. to kids is. That's, that's kind of what I thought was odd. But, I mean, the fact that they did that, they they gave a free, you know, gave kids an opportunity to do free. And it wasn't just one-time shot. I think there were three going on on Saturday and there were multiple ones going on all the other days of the week. So that was kind of cool. Um, you know, we participated in the upper deck rapper redemption, uh, program that they offered again this year. So if you bought a certain amount of packs, you could go to the booth and redeem your little certificate that you got for free packs. And, you know, prominent cuts was, it's kind of upper decks thing that they do for the national and they'll have, a select number of players and of different sports that are signed with them. Uh, um, and so they gave those out and of course, randomly inserted in there were autographs and, and the like. And we were lucky enough to pull a uh, Bobby Hull autograph out of one of our free packs. So that was kind of cool. But the thing I liked about that is, you know, there's a very limited amount of space to sit down and do what, do your business. And um, upper deck offered like a little lounge area where you could, 
kind of sit down at tables in there and bust open packs of cards. So that was kind of cool. That is nice. Um, tops, I didn't really di- didn't really do much with Tops at, the, at their booth. The hi- the highlight of the Tops booth for me was the fact that they had super thick crushed red velvet carpeting. Yes. It was really soft and I wanted to lay down and take a nap on it. Sometimes but, I would just walk through the Tops area just to rest my feet cuz you're walking on yeah. concrete, concrete, concrete and then like Tops has like this lush red carpet and I just like I wanted to like cut like two pieces of it and just like duct tape it to my feet so that like when I walked around I had that like cushioning my feet cuz oh my god that that carpeting yeah, you could you could fall asleep on that Tops carpeting. It was uh it was it it was nice. But I, I didn't we didn't do anything with them because you know obviously we don't you know they don't have a hockey license and we mostly collect hockey so you know they weren't really doing anything well and they're hockey they're, related they're they digital. were giving away stuff for baseball and stuff their so. digital team wasn't there because I Go wanted ahead. to talk oh can you hear me yeah and that was that was yeah their and, digital and, and team that's, that's something that. Uh, their digital team wasn't there because I asked and uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to talk to the top skate people. And then I was told, oh, no, none of our um, digital uh, group came to the national. And I'm like, well, that that kind of sucks because, you know, we buy the coins to play these games. And I remember like two years ago, I got a bunch of uh, coins for the Star Wars card trader and for Tops Bunt. And so I was hoping this year that somebody would be there and be like, hey, want some coins for top skate? And, you know, just give me a bunch of them. But that that didn't happen, and I was I was a little bummed about that. Well, and we actually got, we were kind of excited about it because the same thing, um, you know, the fact that they gave free coins away for the Bunt app and the Star Wars app the last time around. Now that we have the skate app, they decided to go AWOL and they don't show up to the biggest show of the year, yeah. which we were kind of disappointed especially my wife because she's into skate now and you know she does stuff on there pretty much every day so you know she's buying packs and collecting the coins and all that kind of stuff it's funny you bring that up because i don't know if you sat in on any of the the q and a's or anything like that with the companies but um i did that subject did you go to the tops Q&A? I went to the Tops Q and A, but then I was interrupted by a phone call, so I, I had to take that. So I only I was only oh. at the Tops Q and A for like it went on for like I think like two hours, and I was there for probably thirty or forty five minutes. And they were talking about how they, you know, they were talking about how they pack out cards for redemptions, and uh, you know how they decide this, that, and the other thing, and like whatever i mean i mean it was mostly about baseball but they did just mention that they closely monitor when licenses are up for um renewal with like a certain company and and that they um you know that they try to aggressively pursue them when they uh when they have a shot and they they kind of mentioned they're like yeah well football that's with uh, panini for a while and we're, we're not going to be able to get that and then they mentioned, um, but then they said they mentioned upper deck with hockey, but they didn't they didn't say when it was up for renewal, and that's when I was going to ask them. And they said, well, and you know, upper deck with hockey, and then, but they kind of implied like that that license wasn't infinite, like it was either coming to an end or it was going to be up for renewal or whatever. So they didn't really, uh, I didn't I didn't get a chance to ask them, unfortunately, but. Uh, yeah, they did. They did talk about that, and they did say that you know when something's up, they try to go for it. Well, I guess I guess while that was going on, you know, asking people questions and stuff, somebody brought up the fact that they've done some. Uh, I don't want to say shady things to the apps, but they've the the introduction of the diamonds mm-hmm. you, you can buy, and the diamonds are obviously cost a lot more than the coins do and but they'll go they're gonna get you you know super premium cards or more of them okay in the packs that you get and somebody called them blood diamonds Ooh. and i guess that was that was kind of a that was kind of a riot with with some of the collectors in there because you know their response to the whole thing was you know it was it was a response to the to the collector's I guess the, the, the larger, more active 
participants in those in those apps and you know that was that was something that that kind of came up but i thought that was kind of that was kind of funny but um uh, yeah, so we didn't do we didn't do a whole lot with the Tops booth other than admire their carpeting. But I tell you what, they had their when they were doing their redemptions and stuff, their lines were huge. Yes, they went from their booth all the way to the autograph pavilion. I mean, they were long lines. What about the upper deck um, line? So what it, was that like? When we got in it, there wasn't one. Okay, we bought we bought two boxes of series two. And got our certificate and walked right up to the counter, and there was no one there. Nice, because usually uh, they um, they sell out of them real quick. Well, and that was the thing. Everybody talked about how Wednesday night was a big hit with preview night. The VIP parties had more people in them than they've ever seen. Thursday was record crowds. Friday was record crowds. But then Saturday, talking to some of the dealers, they were like. We're just, we don't have the foot traffic today like we had the last couple days. I'm like, that's surprising. So let me tell you about the about Wednesday preview night. And I actually met up with uh, Justin Godfrey, who's a, a blo- we you know, jo- our Justin. And he's a blogger for yeah. um, Raw Charge and SB Nation Lightning blog. So he was there. Um, he was there Wednesday. We met up. We go to the, the so-called Tops VIP party. And so they were going to have three uh, autograph guests. Nate Archibald, former uh, basketball player. I think he was with the Bulls. I don't really follow basketball. Jose Canseco, who we all know and love or hate or whatever, love to hate. And then Ron Duguay of the New York Rangers. He also played with the Penguins and the Red Wings and the LA Kings. And then he played in Germany and he played in the Miners. But anyway, so um, and he actually also best known as a blue shirt. Yeah, best known as a blue shirt. He actually tried out for the Lightning in 92, which is one of the reasons why Justin was there. He wanted to try to talk to him. So we get into the Topps VIP party, and the first thing people did was just line up for autographs. Like, that's all they did was line up for autographs. There were three three lines, and it was funny. Like, the Jose Canseco line was, like, all the way to the back of the room. The Nate Archibald line was like all the way back to the room and like the Ron Duguay line had like three people in it and and I, he signed throughout the whole time and people would like get one of the other athletes first and then go to him and, and I'm, I'm not I'm not dissing him or, or or making him feel bad it just seemed like a really odd player to to like you know because like he was a New York Ranger like you said known best as a blue shirt uh yeah Conseco was big and I mean, this, this well, basketball... he was on the White Sox for a while. Yeah. And this basketball so. player was big. So, I mean, it seemed like, like if I'm thinking of like, if they were going to have like a free Blackhawk signing, it could have been somebody like Dennis Savard or Al Secord. Like, well, Savard's in the hall of fame, but you, you need somebody who's like a name, but like, or, or a Chicago person. Right. And so it was like, if it was like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like a comparable Ranger. Like if it was like, say, Brian Leach, I'm sure the line would be way longer. I mean, and these oh, are yeah. free autographs again, but like I'm just getting, or like Mike Richter, right? Like someone who had like a longer, more accomplished career, people be like, I mean, you'd probably get in line for Mike Richter more more so than, say, Ron Duguay. Am I correct in that assumption? Um, Come on, just work with me here. Yeah, I, I would definitely say if I... If I saw the two of them sitting there, I would recognize Mike Richter, even though he wore a mask most of his career. Right. I would still recognize him over Ron. Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, sorry, Ron. <laughs> but but so I guess what I'm saying is that that just seemed kind of be like a really odd choice of autograph guest. I I liked it because he was unique, you know, yeah. somebody different. So anyway, so people get in the lines, and Chet Kopic is walking around and he's trying to do trivia and he wants to give away stuff and. Like, nobody wants to get out of line to, to, to talk to him, like, because everybody wants to stay in line and get their autograph. So I'm just, like, making, like, me and Justin are just kind of, like, chuckling, like, wow, some party when the first thing you do is just, you go from standing in one line to get in to standing in another line to get an autograph. So then all, they put out all this food, and it's just, just good junk food. It's, like, pizza and little burgers and stuff like that. So, you know, we grab some food, hit a table, and, like, Nobody was even going for the food. They didn't even want to get out of line for food. And you know what card collectors are like with free food, right? 
Well, the free autograph wins yep. out. The, so, and the thing was is that these guys were also signing. They were signing from like three thirty to like or something like uh, two thirty to four, or three three to four. So they were signing for like an hour, and then they were signing for like another two hours afterwards, out where anybody could get their autograph for free. So it was just funny, like. I, I get it. Like you want to get this autograph now, and then when the show doors open, you want to go and walk around the floor. But I think what was sad was that they called it a VIP party, and nobody mingled, nobody really ate. I mean, people ate, but like all people did was stand in line. And they tried to get like people engaged, and it just didn't happen. And and I think that's the that was like the first thing is that just like these shows are just all like I've gone to a, a couple of anime conventions over like the past five years, and those are like a lot more fun. Because they try to get, because people interact with each other, people get together and talk about the stuff that they like, and that just never happens here unless maybe you strike up a conversation with the person in front of uh, you in line for an autograph. I think the difference there, though, is you're dealing with you're dealing with a different demographic of collector. Absolutely, you, know, you go to a comic con, you go to a comic con, or or you know an anime convention or one of those types of things you're dealing with fans you're dealing with genre fans you're dealing with fans of individual series fans of writers fans of you know uh, uh, art you know artists fans of individual fans of things when you're when you're dealing with a sport show like this a, a lot a lot of the clientele that you're dealing with is business people People that are in the business to make money and to turn a dollar. Right. So, you know, you hate to say it, but one of the things that gives autographs a bad name and tarnishes a lot of athletes' opinions of signing autographs outside of an event like this is that very reason. You have guys that stand outside and are autograph hounds, and as soon as they sign something... Ten minutes later, it's up on eBay for hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And so, you know, that's not to say that there isn't somebody that does that in the anime world, or in I'm sure there is, but it's a lot less prevalent, I think, than when you go to a, a show like this. And and I agree with you that Jose Canseco, even if you're not a baseball fan, you probably know who he is. Yes. For other probably for other reasons, the fact that he was such a personality involved with the whole you know, steroid era scandal, you know, he dated Donna for a while, you know, he's got, he's got a laundry list of things that people would might remember him for. Um, you know, Nate Archibald, I'm not a big basketball fan, but even I know who Nate Archibald is. Right. So, you know, and I knew, I know who Ron is just because I'm, I'm a hockey fan. The average sports person outside of New York, probably not. Right. So, you know, having a Chicago personality to draw in that local flavor probably would have been a better bet. I mean, even if it's somebody like even like like Eddie Olchuk or something. Yeah, I'm sure the line would have been just as long. But, oh, yeah, because he's he does. He's a broadcaster for the team now. So everybody knows who he is. Everybody watches right. hockey. And, anyway. that, and that's the thing. And he's not such a superstar. You know, he's not he's not a cane or taze type level. Right, right. But at the same time, he's recognizable and I think he would draw a lot of attention to be like, Hey, let's go talk to let's go get Eddie O's autograph over right, here. Right, so, right, exactly. And so I you know, you're right. I think that's they probably could have done that. But you and I both know the national hockey is a it's it's not a secondary thought. It's like a what would be third? A tertiary thought. I yeah. mean, it's it's on the back burner for in most cases. You know, you know, we be bopped in and out seeing each other on the floor on Saturday, and it's like we were both kind of. Did you see any hockey anywhere? Did you see any hockey anywhere? Oh, this table's got it. Oh, this table has it. I got to remember where it is. You know, it's that kind of thing where, okay, I know I saw some. It was in one box, and it was on the corner of a table, and it was over. Not sure where. So it's almost like you had to throw flags down with GPS coordinates 
you could go back and find where that's the that's not a bad idea. I think I need to like take a can of spray paint and just like mark an X on the floor. So I just look for start looking for the red X's because dude, it just all blends together after a while and you just you just forget. Um Right. I will tell you this though. I did I did make one really cool purchase that I'm excited about. Um on Wednesday night, I found a dealer. He had a whole stack of 7172 cards and I said are those all tops cards he says I'm not sure they might there might be some OPGs in there so I said all right I'll take a look I start looking it's all tops cards there are probably 50 tops cards like Bobby Hall, Bobby Hall Bobby Orr Gordy Howe and I have the complete 7172 top set but there was one OPG card in the mix and it was a 7172 OPG Guy Lafleur rookie card and I looked at it and I said okay what's wrong with it like because it said book price two hundred dollars our price sixty dollars and i said well what's wrong with it so he takes it out of the holder he looks at it he goes oh there's a really light crease in this corner there's a really light crease in this corner and i look at it and i go hmm okay i'll think about it right so i think about it and i'm thinking i'll come back for it you know maybe tomorrow you know i'll i'll, I'll think about it right I know $60 isn't a lot of money, but I was just thinking like, eh, you know, it's got some defects and I wouldn't mind spending more money on one that was in nicer shape, but it really looked like it was in nice shape. So I doubled back and I ended up buying it. And that was actually, um, that's probably the one thing I'm the most excited about. I mean, you know, my big purchase, you know, and it was, yeah, 60 bucks. I mean, that's a lot for one card, but I mean, there are people who pay, I mean, I saw a 0506 Sidney Crosby SP authentic card that had a $2,000 price tag on it. I mean, I saw Gretzky rookies that were graded that had like price tags of like $5,000. So 60 bucks to small potatoes compared to that. And I'm actually really psyched that I got that card that, that I'm still beaming about a week later. I'm just like, yeah, got a Gila Fleur rookie card. That's a good pick because you don't find that very, very often. Nope. And you almost never find that at a show. Nope. Unless it's, Unless it's covered with a 75-pound sheet of plastic. I don't know that I've actually seen one recently. Another thing I was really looking for at this show was I was trying to find cards to fill out my 72-73 Opeachy hockey set, which I've been building kind of on and off, I don't know, maybe the past five years, uh, either online or at shows or whatever. And uh, I got a couple of the high number cards for a couple bucks a piece instead of like eight dollars or ten dollars i was getting them for like two to four dollars which is nice and then um got a couple of unmarked checklists for 25 each which is good for 40 something year old checklists that aren't marked no creases sharp corners nice edges you know what i mean i mean it looked really nice i mean it might have like really t- tiny flaws but no no marking on them and i you know i'm i can live with that for for uh vintage checklists what what about you tim did you any big finds at the show uh i wouldn't say we made any big purchases but we made a lot of purchases so that amounted to to big but um you know we we spent we spent a lot of time standing in lines waiting to participate in various things so we got there about uh, just after they let people just as they were starting to let people in about 10 o'clock, got in line, got in there. We were on the show floor by probably like 10.06. And we didn't really start looking around and start to see everything that was out there until it was well after like 1 o'clock. I mean, it was probably closer to 2 o'clock before we really actually started delving into stuff because we were standing in lines and participating in the various things that they had to offer. So. Made it through maybe three quarters of the of the event floor mm-hmm. and found a few things. Um, I picked up a, um, a stick blade, Crosby stick blade, nice. that I thought was in- very interesting that I've since done research on, and I'm much more comfortable with that purchase. Um, it's a uh, it's, it's a blade because they have the shafts and the blade separate that they mm-hmm. can connect and and use different different blades this is one that he used during his rookie campaign um that wasn't actually game used but it was one of his extras it's still kind of cool 
it's got a, it's got a good story behind it, and I've got some evidence that kind of shows that it's exactly what he used. But uh, uh, so that was kind of cool. Um, we, what else did we get? We got a few boxes that we opened up. We got an old box of Freer Greats of the Game we found. Mm-hmm. Uh, two thousand, what is it? Two thousand, two thousand one, I think. Something Greats like of the game. that, or I think it's like uh, one, two, or two, three. It's it's a nice set though. Yeah, it was. I never, I never really seen this set before. Uh, um, I've seen cards from it, um, so we got, you know, we we found a box and, and got that, and that was fun to open. Um, got a couple autographs out of it, and they're on card, which is really cool. Nice. Um, what else did we get while we were there? Well, you and I yeah, bought some. Just uh, a we bought some cheap sets. There was a dealer. There was. I bought some. Oh yeah. Uh, I bought like a twelve thirteen between the pipe set and like a uh, two thousand one two thousand two Opeechee set and like one other set. Uh, I forget what it was, but for like ten bucks each. This was from a different dealer, and then you and I found this other dealer who had just a ton of like mainly junk junk wax sets, but some some newer stuff. And you know the sets were anywhere from like two dollars to like ten dollars. You got a few of those, I think. Yeah, I think I. Yeah, I got an O four O five SPA set, just the base set. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like a oh two thousand two thousand one the Upper Deck Legend set. Nice which set. Which is a nice look, nice looking set. And then, um, oh, I had uh, the the ninety one Stadium Club set that I've had and pieces of sitting around for years and years and I've never actually tried to complete it. The hockey it's set? It's just been sitting around. Yeah, so now I don't need to worry about it. And what did you pay for that set? Uh, I believe it was $3. Three whole dollars, I know. Isn't that, isn't Three that awesome? Three whole dollars, yes. I bought, I bought um, from that dealer, I mean, I bought like, uh, I think the, the most expensive I bought from that dealer was he had like a 99-2000 Pacific hockey set for 8 bucks, And I'm like... It's 400 cards that's totally worth eight bucks. And then some of them were like uh, an 0304 SP authentic base set for like three dollars. And like, um, actually, believe it or not, I bought I got a few baseball cards at the show, which is funny because I don't really do baseball, but I do like baseball. Like the, if I t- bought them in packs as a kid, then I'll get nostalgic and I'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember the 1989 top set. And then I'll find somebody selling the entire set for like three dollars and I'll just be like, why not? So I bought the the 91 tops baseball set for five dollars. And I already had the traded set that I bought like a couple years ago because I was going to get every top set 85 to 91. And now I have every tops baseball set 85 to 91. Um, and then they had like, remember the big baseball set? I gave you one from 88, I think, or no, I didn't give you one. I gave Justin one. I got one for you. Um, actually I have, let me rephrase that. Tops big. Tops big. Yeah. A couple years ago, I bought some unopened boxes of 1988 tops, big baseball thinking they were 1989. And I started opening them and I'm like, yeah, I'll just, you know, and then I realized, oh, it's the 88 set. So this dealer had the 89 set for $3 and I bought it. And he had the 1990 set for $3 and I'm like, eh, why not? And I bought it too. Cause it was $3 for like a 300 card set, 330 or whatever, 288. I forget, but you know what? It's they're, they're fun to look at. I mean, he had like the complete desert storm series one and series two set with like all the stickers for like $2. And I'm nostalgic about that set. Cause I actually used to, buy those cards at the dollar store. I'd buy an entire box for a dollar. And then I'd build four sets from a box and then I would turn around and I'd sell them for like five bucks a set. So it was just nice. like, I was just like, oh, I remember these. And so, um, oh, I did get one other baseball card though. I got a, um, I have an, I got an autographed Allen and Ginther card from uh, Susan Lulagrage from uh, Tops. Oh, okay. She uh, she used to be my editor when she worked. Uh, she used to be my editor at Tops. Excuse me, at uh, back at Hockey before she moved on to Tops. So I uh, I dropped by the Tops booth to talk to her, and then I pulled out one of my Salberry Blades of Steel trading cards, and I said, "Hey, you're my former you're my former editor. 
Uh, and she remembered me. I mean, she saw me, like, from, like, 20 feet away and, like, waved at me. And I'm just like, oh, you remember me? She's like, yeah, you used to write for me. Of course I remember you. So we started talking. So, like, later in the show, I gave her, like, one of my, my Blade to Steel cards. And she's like, would you like my card? I'm like, oh, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. And she, like, pulled one out and autographed it. And I'm like, oh, nice. You know, I'm like, I should have taken a picture of you autographing this card so that I could just prove to people that you really did autograph it and it's not a fake or whatever. But, you know, we were just chuckling about that. Um and, First of all, uh, yep. that's how you pronounce her last name? Lula Garage. Okay, that's good to know. I know that because... Because there's way too many consonants in it and not enough vowels, and I didn't have any clue how to pronounce it. Doesn't roll off the but we saw her, we, Yeah, we saw her at the show, too, but she was, like, bombarded with people. So I didn't bother going over there. Oh, but yeah, I saw on Twitter of... that she was handed those out, so... yeah. So I I was I, I thought that was nice. I bought a lot like a lot of like cards from like a quarter to a dollar, um, you know, some cheap starting lineup figures. Uh, oh, and then you found me that that five dollar uh, that uh, puck autographed by Brian Bickle for five bucks. I bought that from my girlfriend, and she yes. like, absolutely loves it because she's uh, she's a Bickle fan. I think a lot of people like Bickle a lot. Um, not only because what he's overcome, but just because of you know like the charity work that he did in Chicago and. You know stuff like that. So um, that right. that was a nice find. Yeah, I as I as well got the Bickle Auto. I also got uh, Auntie Ranta autograph puck too for for a pretty good deal. But uh, so that was that was kind of cool. That came from the baseball card exchange guys. They had specials going on every day, so that was that was kind of cool. Which is but, nice um, because I like totally I I like totally bypassed their booth because. They usually sell, like, unopened boxes of cards, and I was just like, well, I don't really feel like spending $1,200 on a 1977 Topps hockey box if I could get the whole set for $50, and oh, I have the whole set already, you know what I mean? So I just I, I, I just kind of bypassed them this year, and I'm glad you pointed that out, because I would not have found that. And I think that's an important lesson, is like, sometimes you got to check every nook and cranny, because you never know. Right. Well, and I made it a point to go to their booth because I knew about their specials that they had going on. And plus, that's one of my local card shops now that they've moved over to Cherville, Indiana with their their headquarters. So, nice. Um, so they have a shop there that you can go in and stuff. And the couple of the people that were working the booth are work the store as well. And they recognized us nice. for the store and they were talking to the kids and sent the kids on a mission to find some stuff out on the show floor, which was, which was fun. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't, I didn't come away with a lot of quantity. Like I said, we had a few boxes. Oh, we did pick up a box of, uh, in the game's final vault. Oh yeah. Um, someone was, some of them was selling them for about 25 bucks. So I thought 25 bucks, I'll go for it just to see what's in it. It was interesting. Um, they bought back pretty much probably, from all of their releases that they ever put out mm -hmm. and reinserted them into their packs and stamped them all. Mm. So there, so there's basically one of every card bought back they could find and re-stamped as a one of one and reinserted into the pack. So got a few autographs and some jersey pieces and stuff like that. So it wasn't bad. What, for, would those, for 25 bucks. Would those be good. considered regurgitated trading cards? Uh... I suppose, yeah. ABC cards already been chewed. Already been chewed. Um, yeah. Did uh, what was I gonna say? Um, oh, you also bought a another box of hockey cards. Um. Oh my! The random box of the four of column craziness. monster box. I have like a yeah, stack like a... of those. I'm trying to get rid of in my apartment of of four column monster boxes full of hockey, and you bought one at the show. Well. The thing is, here, here's the thing. This guy had one box of hockey cards. They were like five cents a piece. And I started flipping through them, and I found little pockets of ones of sets that I was putting together. So I thought, uh, I don't really want to look through all these. Sets, so maybe I'll let go. And then the guy comes over to me, and he's like, he's like, you can have the whole box for 30 bucks. So I'm like, all right, fine. <laughs> so I took it. I mean, it's got it's got some junk wax in it, but it's got some modern, more modern stuff in it, mm -hmm. and it's got 
from what I've flipped through so far, it's got some bizarre things I've never seen before. That's cool. Honest to God. There's stuff in there that I've never seen before. And as soon as I get up. To, as soon as what? As soon as I get up the motivation to write a blog post about some of these things, I'm going to. That's that's funny. I, uh, yeah, I I think that's probably the one thing I do like about quarter boxes is that I will find cards that I've not seen before because, you know, I, I stopped collecting for eh, about a good, really like a four year span, but probably closer to almost an eight year span because eight or ten because I think from like fall of 97 to like just right after the lockout because I just I wasn't buying like the cards then that were coming out so you know I'll find some weird Pacific or Upper Deck or Tops card that I never knew existed and I'll just be like okay this is worth the quarter you know if anything I'll, I'll buy it and it'll remind me to like look into the whole set because there's just so much stuff and that, that's the thing with this box is some of the stuff I was flipping through. I'm like, I've never seen this before. I've never seen this before. There's a whole stack of cards that were, they're Canadian, came out of bread. I've never seen them before. I thought oh, they were interesting. Nice. So, yeah. So, uh, in two years, you're going to go back to the show? I know I am. Oh, most definitely. We actually, we actually had the conversation the other day of whether or not we wanted to drive to Cleveland and go to Nashville. Next year's show. Oh, that's ambitious. You make a weekend out of it. Yeah. But then I thought, it's Cleveland. Yeah. I, I uh, It's going to be in Cleveland, then it's going to be in Chicago, and then it's going to be in Atlantic City. They announced for uh, 2020. It's going back to Atlantic City. So I saw everybody, that. Everybody's making fun of that. And I'm just hoping, all right, hope it comes back to Chicago for 2021. Well, it seems like that's the... That's the M.O. every other year is in Chicago. And, and they like to have it there because it's a, it's central. It's, it's a big enough city that has all the accommodations to support, you know, that type of thing. It's got it's got a good sports background and it's pretty much centrally located. So, and so. I, and I think people, that's why they like to have it there. And people have stuff to do. I mean, people are going to like the Sox games and, and stuff like that. And, and, you know, they can they can do things in Chicago. There's so much to do. And. The convention center and those hotels is right by the train, which takes you downtown. Uh, I mean, I overheard some dealers talking about, like, um, if the show should just be in Chicago every year. And one dealer said, I don't like that idea, but I agree with the idea. Like, he says, I like the show being in different cities every year and everybody getting the national. He said but I understand why they would want to do it in Chicago every year because it just, it seems to make the most sense. Like you said, it's centrally located. It has a big space. It has enough hotel accommodations. It's, you know, manageable to get to by plane, by bus, by train, by car. Um, you know, and then there's, there's things to do. I mean, I talked to a dealer who did the show in Atlantic city a couple, I think it was in Atlantic city or was it in Baltimore? I mean, it does them every year. And he just said that like, there was nothing to do. Like they could have ventured into the city, but it was late and they were tired. And it was just like, there wasn't anything that was more enticing than just staying in their room and getting food. Yeah. You know? And, and whereas like people who come from in from out of town, they're like, Oh cool. Let's go to a baseball game. Oh cool. Let's do this. Let's do that. You know? And if they like bring their wife and, and kids, they can find things to do that, that are interesting if they're not into the sports cards. Right. Right. I agree. I mean, a lot of people complain that it hasn't gone to the West Coast in a long, long time, and I don't foresee it doing that ever just because of, of how well it's done over here. So any uh, any parting thoughts uh, before we wrap this one up? Uh, um, I guess the only parting thought would be that any listeners out there that have never been to a national, you've got to put that on your bucket list if you're a collector Agreed. it's got to be something you do at least once agreed it's well worth it all right well thanks uh and uh you can check both of our blogs on uh stuff that we picked up i'll probably do something uh sooner or later about things that i bought i already did a recap of like the best hockey stuff that i found uh 
Tim is going to treat us with some of the random weird hockey stuff that he found uh, eventually, probably by September 15th or so. Uh, let's push forward for October. In time for hockey season. Hopefully our next podcast will be by then, too. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.